Welcome to the Drop Everything Podcast, sponsored by the International Jugglers Association. I am your host, Dan Holzman, and this is podcast number 10. Very special to be reaching the double digits. So I wanted to make sure I had a great guest today, and I do. I reached all the way across the Atlantic, all the way to France, to talk to the wonderful juggler, Francoise Rocher. I had the pleasure of seeing Francoise when she came to America for her first IJ convention. And uh, many times since then, I've brought her over for IJ shows, had a nice friendship with her all these years. She's a wonderful person, delightful to talk to. So sit back and enjoy this conversation as you drop everything to get ready to hear Francoise Rocher. Welcome to podcast number 10 of the Drop Everything podcast. I'm your host, Dan Holzman. And today I have the pleasure of talking with one of my favorite jugglers of all time, Francoise Rocher. Hello, bonjour. <laughs> Let me start by flattering you a little bit, Francoise. Your act is one of my favorites. My juggler, my favorite jugglers are like Paul Ponce or Tuan, Tuan Li, who have, who have combined the, the technical, the artistic, in a very professional uh, package. And I've had you come out a couple of times to the IGA, and you've always been fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> So could you take us back to the beginning of this creation process? Where did you grow up and, and how did you learn to juggle? Well, I, I grew up by, by a, in a small town by the ocean on the west part of France. And I, I started to juggle because I was part of a majorette troupe. Mm-hmm. You know, this twirling. Yeah, we, we say majorette in, in this majorette. Like, like baton twirlers. Exactly, yeah. So I started to do that when I was five years old and I was performing uh, as soon as I started to have one button in my hand because it was a, it was a button of wood, the first button I had to do majorette. And then when I was eight, the, um, the son-in-law from the director of the troupe of majorette was an Australian juggler. And when he came to France, he decided to teach few girls how to juggle with three batons. And a few girls tried to juggle, but they didn't really like it. And I did like it very much. <laughs> and so after two months, I was juggling with three batons. So that's how I started and why I started also. I think why it's very I- interesting that you didn't start by learning with the balls. You immediately started with the batons, so the flipping yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Never touched a ball before. So I started with batons right away. And after I didn't pick up balls anyway, I was, t- I was, um, I stick with the, the batons. Yeah. The and when time. I think of baton juggling, I think of a particular style that incorporates kind of a, a flourish upon the toss. Like we had a three baton champion named Jeanette Groom who came to the IGA many years ago. And the style of baton juggling is a bit different than, than straight club juggling. Did you juggle them as batons or more as clubs initially? No, really as clubs. I, I juggled them as clubs from the beginning. I, uh, and I really wanted to go away from this majorette uh, style and image. So I didn't want to flip them up in, the, in this way. I really wanted to be a juggler. <laughs> mm. so, so the juggling really, as soon as you saw it and learned, it, there was something about it that stuck. Yeah, I just, uh, well, I, I, was not, I was not seeing many jugglers at that time because I didn't know anybody. And I was living in a small town. And, you know, this time, it's, it's a long time ago. We were yes. not have, uh, even on TV was almost nothing. Of course, no internet. I didn't even have a VCR or things like that. So I was not able to meet any jugglers. So it was just coming out of my mind and also of my family mind. And my family is not coming from this business at all. So we were creating everything again. You know, with, I have three brothers and they were thinking with me about what we could do. So it was like a process of uh, of doing things again that like was existing before it was really funny and it's so by the age of eight you did your first television show so from five so three years later you're actually on television and was that was that in australia so you traveled to australia to perform yeah actually i was 10, 10. so i started to juggle when i was eight and two years later i was performing in an australian tv show um yeah i was invited by this uh, juggler this man and um, so I um, 
I was juggling four torches actually at that time already, and I started to to work on the six batons when I was ten. So. <laughs> Wow, that's a, that's a great, great early start on your on your career. How do you feel about the the nerves? Did you feel comfortable in those situations? Ten years old, being on on television, juggling. Uh, I think I was not uh, conscious of what I was doing. I was hmm. too young, and I was just uh, I loved performing already. You know, as a majorette, uh, I was already doing some shows and. And as a juggler already, you know, a little bit. And I just loved it. So I was not so nervous. I think I started to be nervous more when I was around uh, 13, 15. I started to understand more. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the thing is that they say, we say ignorance is bliss. When someone starts so young, like, a, like an Anthony Gatto or yourself, I think at first they just take it for granted. This is what you do. And, and yeah. there are no nerves. But I was you realize that the ego come, becomes involved, the, the nerves come in. Yeah, and also, you know why I started to juggle six, six when I was 10? Because I took it like uh, it's possible, you know, why not? Not like, oh, that's a hard trick, you know, I was not even thinking about that. I jumped from four buttons to six buttons because I was thinking, okay, it's two in one hand, so let's do three in one hand. I have no idea how difficult it is, so I just pick them up. Maybe if I start to think, oh, it's so hard, I would never be able to, to do it, maybe I don't even try or I, I, I stop myself, you know. But in this case, I don't know. So I just do, I just try. <laughs> and were you still being coached uh, by this Australian juggler? No, not really. You know, it was more my family and we, I mean, my family, you didn't know anything like <laughs> me, no? Right, right. <laughs> no, not really. Just the, the first, one of the first jugglers I saw on TV was Anthony Gatto because we have the same age and I saw him when he was doing the festival in Paris mm -hmm. on TV. And because he was a little child, and I was a child also, I was like, wow, I, I really pay attention in this moment. Like, I want to do like what he's doing. So he was one of my first reference in this uh, juggling world. And what then a great initial I, uh, vision to see that excellence portrayed at such a young age. And like, and once again, you're not even really realizing how difficult these things are. You're just like, oh, I want to do that too. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to do that too. I was that was clear for me, and also the joy I had to be on the stage that was very important for me. I took it very serious, like uh, you know, like I have to practice. Nobody said to me that I have to. I just that was that was uh, something I wanted to do on my own. Did you Not at that point when you were doing this? Did you feel like oh, I've discovered what I want to do? I want to be a professional juggler. Did that realization come that early? I think in my mind, yes, but I was not saying that. I was saying that I want to be a mathematic uh, teacher, maybe because um, it was better in the society to say something like that, but mm -hmm. it was clear I don't want to do something else than, than juggling. And it, clear, it, it became really clear when I did the festival in Paris when I was 15. Is that the, uh, the Cirque de Man festival? Yeah. Yeah. And what was that experience like? Uh, could you just like kind of run through that type of situation uh, as far as the, for the people who might want to get involved in these circus festivals? Is it audition or how do you, how do you get involved in something like that? Well, first you send, at that time you, it's the same today, you send your video and they first uh, see if you, they take you with the video or not, you know. Mm. And, and at that time there was first or French kind of French audition, like we had a um, French show. And then from this show, there was just few acts who were going to Paris festival. Right. To compete. To compete. And now they don't do that anymore. You go directly to Paris. But at that time we were, they were doing that first, like national audition first. So were you representing France? Was that part of the consideration? Yes. I was re representing France. You know, it was my first uh, competition. It was one of the biggest competition I ever done in my life. Mm. So big, you know, 22 nations. It was really something special. And uh, in the Cirque d'Hiver, 
also starting to meet the, all this professional world that I didn't know. I was just 15 and I didn't know what it is. So that, that was, yeah, still today, it's still an amazing memories for me. It's, it was really powerful, a good result because I got silver for the young people mm -hmm. and um, very strong, very, very strong. At that time, were you doing just the batons or had you developed yeah. other, just the batons? No. Yeah, just the batons. I was performing six already that time, that age. And what what year was this? This was about 19... 89. 89. <laughs> yes. 89. And did you do other of these circus festivals? And, and did, what came out of it? So you got the silver medal. Did you immediately get bookings from that? No, I was 15. And anyway, my mother wanted me to finish, I mean, kind of finish my study. I mean, mm -hmm. when, you know, like, so I had two, two more years of uh, studying, uh, going to school in a normal way. But of course, then after for your career, you know, it helps to do all these festivals. Like people see you, professional come and watch this kind of uh, festivals. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why you want to be booked uh, for, for doing shows. But I was not totally ready with my act at this time. Like the, the, the technical I had, but the artistic part of my act was, I was still a teenager. And you could see that in, in the at that age that I look like a teenager, you know? <laughs> and did you, did you become more experienced by seeing other jugglers? So you saw Anthony Gatto. Were there other jugglers around this time that influenced you? Not much, mm. not much, because as I said, I was, um, I was living in a very small town. I was not, we, we didn't have much money at home. So I was not going any places to see some, uh, some performance. I I was just uh, I had some books you know looking for mm -hmm. but I, I I had no chance to see some shows at this age so it was not very easy. How did you then develop your act and at what point did you make what you would consider sort of your professional debut? Was there a contract that came up a multi month or something that allowed you to start your professional career? Yeah, so when I was 17, I after I finished the first part of the study, I, I decided to become professional. And then the, um, I was hired in a, in a park, in a theme park named uh, Puy du Fou, which is uh, quite famous. Actually, they got an award from the States a few few months ago. I was booked there to, to juggle. It's open in the, in the summertime. It's closed in the wintertime. And they hire me all the time. So that was my first professional experience. That's also and funny because my, my first job also was an amusement park at 17. <laughs> at uh, Magic Mountain in, in uh, Valencia. And nice. I would do uh, eight hours a day. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of shows. I was doing five <laughs> shows a day. Uh, it's after a few months, you know, after three or four months, it's a total of 500 shows a day outdoors. So you have to deal with the wind, the sand, the ground, because it's not flat and all the thing, you know what I, what I mean, you know, <laughs> were, were you still living at home at this point? Yes. I know it's, it was a hundred kilometers from home. Oh, okay. So I was going home every, I mean, I had one day off. So for my day off, I was going home. And I was, um, I, I had a trailer already because I live in the, in the trailer for, for five years. So I had no apartments, you know, like And, and what did your mother think about you pursuing a, the career as a juggler? W was she supportive in that? Yeah, my mother was always great because she's, uh, she could see I, I enjoyed this job so much. You know, I, I was, how I would say that in English. <laughs> Sympathetic, maybe you were... yes, sympathetic, <laughs> or you know, it's really it's really the place where I'm the most happy. You mm -hmm. know, like like sunshine. Well, you found, you found your passion. You you found your bliss. Yes, like exactly. They say they always say follow your bliss, and yes. you're also. I feel you know some people are sort of natural jugglers. When you watch them juggle, it, it sort of comes from inside. There's a a, a spirit yeah. that that is exhibited, and you obviously do that. One thing that really impressed me about you is we talked about on an earlier call about your journal, about your juggling journal that you recorded all your shows, uh, the number of times you dropped. Did you did you start that way back then, or is that something that you did later on? 
No, actually, I started that when I, at the beginning, when I was 10, um, because I had to write down all this process of uh, how to always, the, the goal is how to uh, get better. Mm -hmm. So you you find your your own little things to encourage yourself. Sure. <laughs> so this is my way. Like, um, of course, not dropping is good. Yeah, it's a good feeling. <laughs> well, well, can so, you explain what you what you put in your journal about the shows you do? Well, I always write down how much I drop and if I don't drop. And the, the goal is, uh, is of course, it, it's how many shows without drops. Mm. So most of the time, I'm, I'm around uh, 80% of not dropping. So it's good. This is... Uh, this is pushing me. Like if I go a little bit down with that, come on, you know. <laughs> so can, you, can you tell us how many times you've dropped over your entire career? How? Oh, maybe I have to <laughs> check that in my. Uh, but it's it's a problem. It, approximately half, because of course at the beginning I drop more. Right, right. So it's 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 approximately half of uh, non-dropping shows. Well, I think I've never seen you drop. I think the times you've, I've seen you perform, you've always been perfect. <laughs> how, how many shows that have you recorded that you've done in a row uh, without dropping flawlessly? Oh, I don't know. I think something around the 30 or 40. I don't know. Something like that. That's fantastic. So that's a good, a good tip, though, for people who are starting off. I think it's never too early to start recording uh, information about the shows you do how the show went, who hired you, your experience, how much money you made. When I first started out uh, doing Renaissance fairs, I used to keep track of every show and how much we made in the hat and how much I made overall. It's nice, yeah. But then I lost it. I lost the journal after like three years. And I thought, oh, well, then I just won't do it. And I really <laughs> regret. And then now I have no idea how many shows I've done or how much you know I've earned over my career. And, and I don't want to think of how many times I've dropped, but uh, I'm sure that's quite a few. But it's also quite interesting to to write it down because it's so many things I forgot. And sometimes when I go through, I'm like, oh, yes, I've done that. I've been there. I don't even remember. It's, it's really – and it's interesting to see the road, you know, the way. And uh, it's it's helping. It's helping very much for me. I mean, it's, I don't say that. <laughs> no, I think it's great. It's one of the things I really uh, admired that that kind of dedication to keep track and really, no, I think it's just fascinating to be able to look back, like you said, and go, oh, in this year I did this, this show and this was the experience and uh, these are the people I worked with. Because my memories over the course of my career, there's a lot of fading. There's a lot of things I don't recall anymore about the gigs I've done and, and I find that kind of sad for me, so... It's yeah. nice to be able to go yeah. back and, and have this memory, uh, this journal. You know, sometimes in the in the same week, like in September, I was in uh, in Italy, in Berlin, then in Denmark. I don't, 15 years later, I don't remember that. For sure, I don't remember that. So it's 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 nice to go back uh, and to say, okay, oh, I was with these people, I've done that. And it's very precious with all the... What is growing up also is the relation between artists and between all together, you know, it's, and it's nice to remember people you work with and the special moments and it's yeah. like all these badge, oh, how you call that in English, you know, all the things you put around the neck that you, that give you the, the permission to come inside. A, I, I keep all that. It's crazy. I have hundreds <laughs> of this. It's very funny. No, it's great. I think, like I say, I really regret <laughs> not being able to go back and, and uh, say, oh, yeah, in this year I did this gig and then I had this experience. Because someone says, oh, have you, like on a cruise ship, I've done maybe 80 cruises and I don't think I can really remember any of them that clearly. So <laughs> let's go back to your, your professional career. So you've started yeah. with this very extensive amusement park job where you're able to do hundreds of shows in kind of a very difficult environment. And yeah. really building up your your professional abilities, and so where where'd you go from there? So from there, I because it was like you did like this uh, Renaissance Renaissance um, theme. Yeah, we call them Renaissance so, uh, pleasure fairs. 
Here. Yeah, so I, I was juggling with uh, big baskets or tambourines or I always had so many different kind of props. But I, I had the feeling I'm stuck with the... Um, uh, I wanted to go in, in a more modern or so style somehow. I And also I wanted to travel the world, to see the world. So I decided to quit this, this theme park uh, after I've done uh, some... They sent in the, this park sent me in China and in Russia to get better because that was always the idea. I was just 19, so of course I, I need to get better. But after that, I quit them anyway, explaining them that I need to 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 see the world and, so, and to get. So you're saying they sent you to China and Russia to train? Exactly. Oh. Yes. Yes. And I think China was was one of the hardest experiences I've done in my life. I was practicing eight hours a day. They asked me to do 30 times my act a day, 10 in the morning, 10 in the afternoon, 10 in the evening. And my hands were bleeding, you know, like just Sunday afternoon of off. That was very hard. And I was sent there alone, so I could not speak. This is very interesting uh, experience. Not to speak all day to nobody because they they speak just Chinese. They were not speaking English or mm. French, of course not. Yes. And <laughs> and I was sent in the um, the army, the acrobatic army of Guangzhou. So it was um, it was held by by the army. So every morning, afternoon, and evening, we had to listen to some speeches. And in Chinese. In Chinese. Oh, it must have been so dull. <laughs> it was very special. And I was just 18, actually. And did you, did you have, were the teachers, were there's a, was there a juggling teacher that, that specialized with you? Or did you get sort of more of a general training there? Well, of course, I, I know I didn't get a general training because they were doing a lot of things that I am not able to do. I was just able to juggle. But there you never went into acrobatics or, or did they ever want you to do... You know, more no, physical. They, want, they wanted me to juggle all day, basically. <laughs> 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 all day. And there was a very good juggler. So we were juggling together. And there was also a choreographer. So mm. this choreographer was behind me more to teach me how to dance, how to move. Because that was my hardest, the weakest point, you know. I could, I could do a lot of uh, technical stuff, but I didn't know what to do with my body. So... <laughs> So I, they also put me on this road, you know, on this uh, how, how to get better with the artistic part. How long were but, you in? How long was this training in China? Uh, three months. Oof. <laughs> wow. And then did you go immediately to to Russia, or was that a different a different time? That was uh, the winter after. In the summer, I was back to make all these shows in the park, in the theme park. Mm -hmm. And the winter after, they sent me in Russia. And how, how did that experience uh, differ from the experience in China? Very different, um, very different. Also very special because Moscow, Moscow in 92, you know, they just opened the frontier. So I could also see all this um, very way, very hard way of living. You know, I, I, I'm from France. And when I was in China and I see all these uh, people in the streets and then I see again in Russia all the difficulties they had to live and there's a big shock for me, you know, really. To... So that was your first experience sort of seeing the poverty that, that some yeah. people live in. Yeah, yeah, really. And was there a special uh, juggling teacher in, in Moscow? Was there a, a teacher there that... No, no juggling? juggler. Again, oh. it was more to, to make an act with my with my juggling. So there was no juggling teacher. It was more around how to dance, how to build an act and all these things. And uh, I was uh, working with a famous choreographer at the time. His name is uh, Gnushev. So we were together like for six weeks or something in, in Moscow. At what that point was... did the batons start to look like uh, flowers? Because I remember that was when I first saw you, you the batons were more look like little like thin flowers. Yeah, so then I then I started to work with a choreographer from Amiens, the the director of the circus schools from Amiens, mm -hmm. and she she was a dancer before, so she really um, make my act as a, uh, like dancing and juggling, and she got the idea 
to to change the to give this idea of this is flowers now you are in a, how you say that in english you are a, um, in a field is that right in a field in a field you are in a field and you you pick up flowers mm. And I had this big hat at the time. That's that's the act I done at the IGA in Yeah, I remember that. Yes, yes. And it started to have an, um, a story around the juggling. She brought me there, this woman. I think that's another very important point to sort of have a, a thematic presentation or have something deeper in the meaning of your juggling than just watch me juggle. Exactly, exactly. And And this is the moment where you can bring emotions And this is the moment where you become a real artist. Because before we are more technicians, you know, we have to, to give more than just technique. So it started there with technique, of course, but then you have to give your, yourself, your mm -hmm. soul, your feelings, your emotions. And you have to find your own way how to give that. And it's, this is very hard to find, actually. I found it very hard for myself, actually. <laughs> And then, so my, my first experience of you was, was in 1995. Had you mm -hmm. gone to other uh, juggling conventions before you went to the International Juggling Association Festival? Yeah, I was, uh, my first juggling convention was in uh, Rosé, which is close to Nantes in France, in uh, 87. Uh, I was 13. And I, yeah, that was my first one. It was very nice to meet other jugglers. I mean, this was kind of the first time I meet other jugglers mm -hmm. in uh, 87. And I remember um, a job you had, I think, I think it was in Japan, where you mm -hmm. were maybe with Michael Chirik or, or Dick Franco. Yes. Yes, I think this was in uh, 99. Oh, okay. So that's after even the IJA. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, because before I didn't know any Americans. I didn't know any American juggler before '95. And how I, did you get out to the IGA? Was uh, was that your first trip to America? Yes, actually, I was kind of having no work, and it was kind of difficult. And a friend of mine said, "Look, you should go to America. They're gonna love you there." And I was like, "I don't know. You know, I have no money. I cannot even buy a ticket to go there." And uh, I said, yeah, come on, you have to find some money and go there. And I said, okay. So, so I went and it was amazing. For me, it was so good. You know, this experience in the, in the States was great. Actually, I always was good welcome by Americans. And I have to say a big thank you to all of you because all the time is the same. And uh, you give me a lot of strength to believe in my, in my job and in, uh, because it's not always easy every day you know sometimes i really wanted to give up so to to do this iga festival in 95 that gave me a lot of power yeah because you you won the gold medal yes <laughs> and uh, as i remember the the jay gilligan came in second yeah because i was a judge that year and there was um there were people some people wanted jay gilligan to win and and some people including myself wanted you to win uh -huh. because my opinion was that <laughs> You had a complete act. You had an act where if someone saw it, a producer or agent, you could go work. You could work in the top variety theaters or the top circuses because your act had that kind of professional polish where Jay would, did some good juggling, but it was sort of more unfocused and not really an act per se. So I was very much swayed by your professionalism. Thank you. And you know, this is this is what I believe. There is this first step where you learn this uh, all this technique, but then you have to to become an artist. Yeah. Yeah, I always think that you learn the technique so that you can express yourself creatively through the art form. But it's not about mastering the technique. The technique is a tool that allows you the abilities to then bring your own self to it. I totally agree. Yeah, it's exactly that. And what really impressed me, too, is that after you won, when you then performed in the public show, you had different music, you had a different costume. So you had actually a separate act prepared uh, for, the, for the performance. And that was very rare at the time. Most times when people won, they just would duplicate the exact same act they did, but then in the public show. But you had this great other costume, like more, sort of a leather thing, as I remember. It's very memorable, even though it's you know, 20 years ago for me. 
you remember everything. Yeah, it's exactly, you know, at that time I was doing this very slow and romantic part and I also, I wanted to be a little bit more active. Mm. And I guess that's why I had this uh, second act. After, after all this, I wanted to put all this together somehow. That's why today my act is built with these two parts mm. because I, I love both of, of it. Like to be, for me to stay very um, woman on the stage and, and also to, to become a little bit more, uh, what I would say, uh, crazy in a way, not mm. crazy. Uh, well, you put out a lot of um, energy. You're very energetic and you're very uh, exciting to watch. The last last um, video I saw of you, I think you were doing it to uh, "Rolling on the River." The yes. proud Mary. Proud, yeah, proud Mary. And if people watch your act, they'll see a definite switch where there's a certain point where you you do like a costume change. The first mm -hmm. part is very poetic, uh, yeah. very graceful, sort of a slower aesthetic. And then at a mm -hmm. certain point, the music changes, the costume changes, and you just go crazy. And it's really exciting to watch and, and great fun. So. <laughs> We'll put up a link to, to your appearances so people who, who haven't experienced you will be able to see exactly what we're talking about and be inspired by your, by your great act. So we'll have a link on the site here. Now, yeah. then, uh, at what point did you win the, uh, the, the Guinness record? Because then you, you set a record for juggling seven batons. What, what year was that? Uh, 99. 99, okay. So let's go back to 95. So you, you come out to America, you win the gold medal. Did that help your career? Was that something that people can look at and say winning the IGA is helpful for a professional uh, career? Uh, it didn't help my career directly. It helped my my self confidence, I would say, my trust in myself. Because in this moment, I really wanted to quit. I mean, many times I wanted to quit, but but at that time, I was like, okay. If, if it's like that, I cannot, I have to hold on, you know, to, to keep trying, find some jobs and uh, believe in what I'm doing because some people believe for me, you know, in what I do. That helped me a lot in this way. And also then I also uh, met Anthony there, people like, like you or uh, Dick Franco and all these people, all artists, great artists pushing me like continue, continue, it's going to work for you one day. And, and in this way, it helped me so much, really. But, I, but after IG, I didn't get co contract, you know, I didn't mm, yes. sign any contract. Well, there were, were, I, didn't really bring out a lot of producers. It's not like one of these big circus festivals where people are going to look for acts. Yeah. Uh, the IJ is definitely more of an organization of jugglers for jugglers. And maybe that's something they could look into is, is sort of having more of an element where they invite or encourage agents to come and watch the, the championships and help yeah. people uh, springboard their professional careers. Now, let's go to, uh, so you've done the convention, you've won the gold medal. What, what kind of uh, venues and, and performances come after that? After that, I mean, I I, you've done, you did a lot more TV shows. You did TV shows in Moscow and TV shows in China. Was that around this period or before? Uh, this was before. Mm. But after, after IGA, I, I did like a very nice, uh, some very nice project. Like I went to Japan. We did a, a creation, a, a new show in Canada. Then we were touring it in, in Japan. That's, that was very nice because it was made by, by um, someone who was working in uh, Cirque du Soleil before. That was also something new where I started. It's the first and the only time where I was also performing with other jugglers, with people from Cirque Eloise. We were doing uh, passing uh, six people. So I was the only girl. I was doing my solo. And after we were doing uh, six, an act with six persons. And that was a very nice experience, yeah, for three months in Japan. Now, let's go back. I'm sorry. When you did this, uh, the, the Guinness World Record, for people who are interested in becoming Guinness World Record holders, how did you apply for that? Was that something that you uh, sent in your, your information and uh, video about the seven batons? No, actually, uh, all these things came to me. I was not really going for this kind of thing. When I was little, very little, in, in my region, there was um, a big event with um, Guinness World Record. Mm, okay. So 
they, they organized that for, for a weekend. Then I was, con- I was contacting them uh, because, I, as I told you, I started to juggle 10 buttons when I was 10, and I could do it when I was 13. So it was already in the Guinness Book because this was like 30 kilometers away from home, <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. So I, I had to perform there, and I was in the Guinness Book of, of Record at this age already, in, ni- in 87. 87. Now, I just saw the, the latest issue I think you're in as well. Is that so a- the latest issue, it was when I, did, when I did a show in Japan. First, I did the seven buttons on the stage, and the producer of the show decided to contact the Guinness Book. I didn't do anything. Right. Because I performed it, and they knew it's not uh, like nobody, no woman did it before. So they did all the process, the, the procedure of of, um, of trying to get a world record. And then one day I received the record in my mailbox. You know, I didn't do <laughs> like anything. A <laughs> a certificate. Yeah, I, I, I had set uh, two records myself, and mine were very uh, uh, not suspect, but. Like at a certain point, they had a fellow, his name was Gino Jones. He was involved with the International Juggling Association. He was sort of, he was the correspondent for the Guinness uh, Uh for juggling. And so he was Uh looking for juggling records. And I was a friend of his and I was at his his, uh, apartment and he asked me, do you do anything that no one else does? And at the time I was doing eight shaker cups. Uh I had a picture with me. He said, oh, that looks, that's a great picture. We'd love to put that picture in the Guinness book. And I never even did the trick for him to for him to see. Uh-huh. It was, they just like the picture, and they gave me the record based on the on the picture. So of course nice. I could do the stunt. Uh-huh. Uh, I know you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, oh, that was not quite the experience I thought. As as of course now getting in the Guinness Book is much different. Uh, and I also got one for bouncing the uh, golf ball in the face of a golf club. And I did that uh, at this in his apartment as well. I just did it for like fifteen minutes and set a record and. I had two Guinness records. <laughs> I think it's one of the things that uh, people, like when you have your credits, it definitely is something that sort of establishes you as a certain level. If you say, I'm a Guinness world record holder. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not a goal for me. You know, it's, it was just because how to communicate, how, how to communicate that, that you, your level. It's difficult, especially when you have to speak for, for your own act, you know? Yeah. You're not selling someone else. So with these things, with all the festival, winning a IGA gold, you know, we, having a Guinness World, it, it's helping to communicate to professionals. Yeah, it's something, something, something definite. You can say, well, I'm a good juggler. Yeah. It's like before, years ago, uh, the sign was if you were on the Johnny Carson show, uh, as far as a certain level of for mm-hmm. variety act. And if you could say you'd been on the Carson show, it automatically gave you a stamp of approval mm-hmm. so that when you sold your act, people understood the level of quality based on that, cre- on that credit. Because sure. most people don't know, you know, good juggling from bad juggling. or They only know that a bad juggler drops. That's what <laughs> I say. If you drop, it's like they know that's bad. But besides that, they don't, they don't know very much. Yes, because uh, if, if you would ask me in another discipline, maybe I don't know anything, you know, so it's normal. They cannot know. Now, do you feel, uh, and hopefully this isn't a, a sexist question, but do you feel as a female juggler that you've sort of faced different problems or difficulties, or have there been some advantages? I would say both. Yeah, sometimes I think it's, uh, it was harder. First, I think I had to convince more because it's a woman juggler. We're not really, you know, yeah, you have to convince that it could be as good as a man. Mm -hmm. But in another way, it's also very different. So, of course, you can point on the difference, like say, look, it's different. So then it's, it's better to hire someone who is different than to hire always the same kind of, the same style of work. Well, especially like if you look at booking a juggling convention, there are yeah. so few top flight uh, female jugglers mm-hmm. that, that you definitely stand out as, as something good and different, which is always always a, an advantage. Were you inspired by any other female jugglers? Did you see was someone like Gina Schwartzman or something? Did you when you became aware of other females? Was that something that encouraged you? Uh, 
Well, I, I was not really uh, growing up with uh, all this getting uh, some inspiration mm. because as I told you, I had no video, nothing, all <laughs> these kind of things. So I really developed myself on my own without any inspiration, I would say. You know, it was I really... Think I think that's the best way. I mean, when I started, I started in 1974. Uh -huh. And I'd say for the first seven years, I saw... I think no jugglers in person, I don't think. I saw one juggler on TV, and that was uh, Chris Cremo, yeah. who is uh -huh. still, my, still my favorite, still my hero and, and idol. I, I can't uh -huh. speak. And hopefully one day I'll be able to talk with him on this podcast because uh, he, he really was inspirational for me and, and instrumental early on. Uh -huh. But you're forced, especially if you, if you feel a, a drive towards juggling, to create because now you have no... Like nowadays, there's a lot of advantages when people get to watch a ton of juggling on YouTube and, and you know, to see a lot. But when you're forced to sort of create right from the start your own style, your, I think that's when you really create these, these great yeah. individual unique acts. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. even today, my favorite props are props like I just found a uh, two ball tennis can. It, it only fits two balls. <laughs> and I used to do a lot of three ball and tennis can and no one else has, has done this because I found this prop in Korea so I really uh -huh. like a prop where everything you do it has to be original because no one else has done it before and you've never seen anybody do it before you you also very much into uh, uh, creating things using props that people don't use and uh, building your props I mean all my props is built even the batons I use now it's not batons because I changed the uh, the middle part. So it's, I, I agree, you know, you cannot just uh, look at all these hundreds and hundreds of video. It gives you uh, already a direction. It doesn't make you develop what you have inside uh, yourself. And I think to become a really good performer, you have to go through this. Well, maybe, what is inside of you? Maybe you can become a successful performer, but can you become a successful artist? And yeah. There are a lot of people out working who, especially maybe in the, the cruise ship market or a market where they're looking for a particular style of juggler, where people are sort of go towards a certain direction and the acts tend to look fairly similar because that's what they're buying in that market. It's hard to create something original and different because you have to convince people it's good and convince people to buy it. But, you know, I, I completely, for me, it's more interesting to see people creating diff, something different. But in the market, you, you can see that people feel safer to hire something that they've seen before. Sometimes it's like that. They're like, yeah, but this we don't know. And if they've seen some kind of product, they feel more safe because they know it works. And so they're going to hire the same thing. That, that's what I see a lot, and then you yeah, want to be rewarded for being original. <laughs> this makes me sad because it's it's this is not my way. It's just then it's easy just copy something that works and that's all, you know. Then well, there are people who do it as a profession and they want to make money and they want to get jobs and they're not into the creative aspect of it. They're not doing it as a creative exercise. It's a they like the juggling and they put together a, a package that works or sells. But yeah. I don't think I would have been involved for you know, over 35 years, 40 years, if that was the only thing I was getting out of it. If I couldn't express myself and create and come up yeah. with new ideas, um, then I don't think I would have stayed interested. Person. Yeah, I think, I think we have the same idea about what is it, it is to be a juggler. <laughs> now, now, Francois, you've had hundreds of engagements. Can you kind of give us like one favorite and then one what you would call maybe what we would call a hell gig, like one that really was poorly, poorly done and, and you felt that uh, it was memorable because of its badness? But maybe let's start with one of what you, you feel like your favorite engagement of your career. Oh, that's very hard because <laughs> there was many. <laughs> okay, all these uh, competition moments was um, 
very special you know when you when you are in competition and it works very good and uh, like IGA was very strong for me uh, really because you know you come to to a place where I'm not used to this kind of audience people screaming standing up and all this it was like I was crying before the end of my act you know it was really I was just 21 I was not ready to receive that you know so this, this well, is we loved you we, we, as soon as we <laughs> met you we loved you Francois so. that was great so all the, or, or another moment where I was in a, in a big theater, like 2,000 seats, and we, I have to play with live music, but it's like 30 musicians on the stage with violins, and, and they play my music, and I juggle in front of them, and you see, you feel all this energy from all these 30 people playing music behind you in front of this huge audience, Ah, oh, that also was fantastic, you know, like this combination of art where musicians, jugglers and singers all together, we are all together on the stage. It's very powerful. This kind of shows, I, I just, uh, yeah. yeah I think like when, the, when the pressure is up, when you, when you do an experience where, because a lot of times I think we do shows and you get into an engagement and certainly opening night is very exciting. But yeah. then you kind of settle in. But sometimes yeah. these one-off shows where the pressure is on, whether it's a big competition or a, a live TV show, and when you rise to the occasion and really perform well with that kind of pressure, I think that's when we can be the most proud of ourselves. Because I think a lot of people who are maybe amateurs or hobbyists, they don't understand the difference between juggling and doing a juggling act, let's say in your backyard or you know, in the gym, and then doing yeah. that same act, like under the pressure of like one of these big Cirque du Monde festivals or a live TV show. It's very different. Very different. <laughs> you know. That's why I always say when people say like, oh, this person's a great juggler or that person's a great juggler. To me, a great juggler performs under the highest pressure situations night after night and, and always rises to those occasions like Center Ring, Cirque du Soleil or... And has Cirque du Soleil ever approached you? I, I, I feel you'd be a, a perfect uh, fit for their, yes, for their shows. Yes, they approached me, but nothing concrete uh, happened. So it's, I would have liked to work for them, you know. It, it's funny because the last um, festival I've done, a few weeks ago actually, there was uh, Philippe Agoguet in, in, the, in the jury. Mm -hmm. And... He came to me and we spoke together. I was like, okay. I, he says like, ah, I love your act and all this. I said, where can I sign? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's something that you just need to pursue. That that if you were to go after it and really, because uh, we were talking about, you know, coming up, we were both talking about what we were doing in 2015. Maybe yeah. that would be something where you need to say, okay, let's do this. Yes, but it's not so simple. Like, you know, sometimes they have some concept and uh, mm. they think it doesn't fit to the concept. It's not about the quality. It's also about the idea of the show. And then it doesn't happen. And then sometimes they call me and then I'm not available. And it's a combination that it's... Yeah, it, that makes sense. Because I just feel like sometimes they, they take an act and it's maybe... There was one fellow who was maybe like a... I think, I forget his name. He was like a circus, a Mexican circus juggler. Uh-huh. And they just sort of took his act and put him in the Cirque costume. But it was sort of a Mexican circus act in a Cirque costume. Mm -hmm. I guess, but it fit into the, the theme. So yeah. I guess they have to look at it and go, how does this fit into our overall concept? It's, I think you'd be fantastic. And I'll, I'm going to put a good word in for you. I'm going to call them up and, and let them know. That, Thank uh, you. <laughs> even though I don't, I don't know anybody. Now, have you ever done any of these uh, dinner shows? Where you yes, I've done many. I've done many dinner shows in, in Germany. Actually, I've worked a lot in Germany. There's a lot of very good places to work in Germany. So, you know, this uh, also, this when you are a juggler, you also have to be ready, as you know, to perform in uh, many different kind of places. So this place is like two meters big. Mm. It's, it's a circle, two meters. You know how small this is? It's like a table. Yeah, yeah, we had, a, we had a Teatro Zanzani was our version out here in San Francisco. Yeah, you, so you know how it is. And then, it's a small, and you're surrounded by the tables. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you better not drop on the other tables and then make... And did you have an opportunity to act? Were you like a character that was 
throughout the production and then you did your act? That's how we have them set up here. Well, I was always doing little things around, yes, but not like a real character, just more like the this French romantic woman. That, that was my character. So. Yeah, I've, seen, uh, I've seen Victor Key in a couple of the theaters and Zanis. Yeah, and he always plays this very strong character, and it's it's a it's a nice addition to someone to see them outside the context of their act, still able to pull the focus and be charismatic. Of course, Victor Key is sort of charismatic just standing there. Yeah, but it's nice to see someone who can incorporate their their talents throughout the entire show, bring in acting and bring in other elements. I've never done a show like that. They're they're quite long. I mean, that the evenings are like three hours or something. The entire productions. Yeah, exactly. Well, when, when when they book you for such a places, they always want you to do this kind of things, to go in the tent and to speak with the people and to be around and to do little tricks and, and things like that. So, you know, and you get to learn and then you, there is a story. So you can play around the story from the, from, from the evening. And then with the others, you can create little stories between each other. And uh, there is always little things to do in this kind of show. There's a lot of room for that yeah i like them i've never done them themselves but i've always enjoyed the experience of going to see them like i say we don't it's not really something that's very popular here we had one torn down because the uh the america cup race came in we had it right at the uh, pier 39 wharf yeah. area i've seen it i went once to san francisco i remember one time you visited me uh, and we went out to lunch and you yes. were here in san francisco when was that that was quite a while ago uh i think it was 2003 is that possible? Yeah, it was before I did the Reno Festival. Oh, right, right. So let's talk about some juggling conventions. Um, you've been brought out as a special guest for quite a few uh, IGA festivals and, in fact, also won the Award of Excellence at the last festival, which yeah. was very well deserved. <laughs> what other festivals have you been invited to and can you? Uh, are there any ones that stand out as ones that are were really favorite conventions, juggling conventions? Well, it was always nice. Uh, the one we did in 2003, I think that was, well, it was Anthony Gatto was there, uh, uh, Paul Ponce was there, uh, Victor Key was there. Was that, that in was, Reno? That was in Reno. Yeah. 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 I think you Mark McGuire, the, the booker for Cir uh, the Circus Circus, yeah. he yeah. put out all the stops and put on some fantastic shows. Yeah, we were... It was great to to meet all together, you know, in, in, in this place. Well, I always have fun going to juggling festivals and juggling all together, and especially when, can, when I can meet friends and see Victor. And uh, The last one I've done was this uh, EGC this year. It was yeah, really nice. I, yeah, I went for one day. I missed you there. I wish I had seen you. I was great. In, in Ireland, Victor was there also, Victor Key. Yeah, Michael Motion, Victor Key. Michael Motion. Uh, uh, Steve Mills. I guess you had quite Steve. a few adventures with Steve. He was. Yeah, Steve Mills was there. Was the I think it was the first time I really met him. You know, we had a great time all together. It was really, really nice. So then it's also a moment where you can share your experience with other jugglers because, of course, uh, otherwise we are never sharing the same stage because we are booked in different places. So no, I I like it very much. Yeah, the last show I ever directed, I think, was. Um... What was that? Uh, um, North Carolina. Was that the last time I brought you out to the IGA? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've. Um, yeah. Uh, Luke. Luke Wilson was in the show, and uh, I think yeah. Michael Davis was in yeah. the show. Yeah. Oh yes. 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 Yeah. It was great. Also. So Remember great. Remember how, how bad my back was that I, I could barely. Yeah, I could barely was... stand. Yeah. I, I at that point it's I had some good. back problems. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very difficult uh, convention for me. I had thrown my back out the very first night and I had to direct the show and had quite a few responsibilities and was was miserable but well, it was very nice to have you there because you know like uh, it's also very nice to have a professional uh, um, cord uh, coordination with the with the show and how to you know because with the light and all this organization it, it was very nice to have you there really well I think that was the 13th one I had done yeah, you know, it's it's like we get used to doing these one-offs where you put it all together, you have one night to do it, and it would be great to be able to do it several nights and work out all the bugs, but mm -hmm. it's one and done, and you have to just uh, do it in the moment, 
So that's very nice. I was never part of the organization, actually. One day, maybe. <laughs> well, you know, I've always uh, been a, a big fan, and I've always uh, tried to use you whenever I could because there are a few acts that I think you can trust that are consistent that you know will will bring it when the when the pressure is on. And I think so highly of you and your professionalism. So. So we're Thanks. coming towards the end. We, we try to do about an hour, and we've actually gone about uh -huh. an hour. Oh, yeah. Was there any uh, – we had talked a little bit about uh, gigs that it went awry. Is there any gig that really went badly and that maybe there's something we can learn from it uh, to try to avoid in the future? I, I know I've had my share of, of – Well, gear. yes, of course. Um, when I started in this theme park, I was juggling in any kind of weather. Mm. So – there was sometimes really, really special moments, like under the rain. So of course, everything is very slippery. Oh. And myself, I could also fall on the floor because um, it was too slippery. And you're moving around but, a bit, yes. Yeah. But one day was kind of funny afterwards. In the moment, it was not really funny. But there was like, I was juggling on the stage. And then I flew one very high. And the wind goes so strong that mm -hmm. my buttons goes behind, behind the stage. <laughs> Right. In the water was was but far away, like flying away from me. So so now I have one prop in the water. I can, I'm stuck, you know. I'm missing some props on the stage. Yeah, that's... That was that was kind of funny. It's like when Anthony told me this kind of story. Also one day he was, I think it was in the Lido, and he dropped run ring exactly in between two pieces of wood but you know how thin it is it's sure. like there is, there is almost no no space and the ring went so well into this gap that it went under the stage and this is something that if you try to do something like it's not gonna happen but it happened and that's really you do yeah. enough shows and, and almost anything's gonna happen i'll tell one story that uh we were doing a corporate event in uh, Texas, and one of our routines, my partner juggles uh, garden weasels, which are kind of like a spike on the end of a stick. Uh -huh. We use them for irrigating uh, gardens and, and soil, ball with spikes that's uh, quite heavy. Uh -huh. and he does a joke where he pretends he's going to throw it out in the audience, uh -huh. and the head of it <gasps> comes off of the body of the club <gasps> and, and flies a good 50 feet. <gasps> Because he pretended to throw it with some force, like he really, like like you're gonna throw a hard chop, oh. try to pretend, and the whole thing came off and flew 50, 75 feet into the audience. Oh my god! And if it had hit somebody, especially somebody in the front, I think it would have done. I don't know if it would have killed them, but it definitely would have made uh, done serious injury. Oh my god! And so <laughs> it flew out, and luckily landed uh, in between a couple of tables. I think it brushed some guy's shoulder who was wearing a, a fairly heavy jacket. And I'm on stage, I'm playing the drums, and I see my partner run out into the audience. I'm like, what's going on? And then, and he, then, I, then uh, we, luckily we were able to finish the show and we got a, a good response. And, and they were like, wow, how'd you get that to fly out like that? <laughs> wow, that was a great effect. See, you are very good professional because they didn't even realize it was not on purpose. So that's very good cover recover. Very good, but that that could have been like <laughs> Raspini's Kill a Man, you know. <laughs> well, Francoise, what a pleasure to talk with you, and thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, thank you so much to you. <laughs> and hopefully, we'll, we'll our paths will cross. I hope so too. I just want to say. Uh, Vous êtes très jolie and uh, <laughs> merci, merci beaucoup. beaucoup. Merci, merci beaucoup. beaucoup. Thank merci. you, Francoise. Au revoir. Thank you. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed the Drop Everything podcast number 10, my conversation with the beautiful and talented French juggler Francoise Rocher. Let's thank our sponsor for this episode, the International Jugglers Association. Information about the IJA can be found at juggle.org. Now, let's also thank our great engineer for these podcasts, and she also does all the work on the video version, my wife, Karen Holzman. Thanks once again to all our listeners. Thanks for the positive feedback. This is the first podcast of 2015. So let me wish everybody out there big success in their personal and professional lives. This is Dan Holzman signing off for the Drop Everything podcast. Go out there and drop everything except when you're juggling.